Dr. Bernice A. King. And I'm Dr. Kimberly P. Johnson. And we are the co-authors of It Starts, starts with, with Me. Well, it, 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 it starts, starts, with, starts with me. No, no I think it, starts it really with you. starts with me. No. Well, well, maybe it just starts with you. It starts with you. This is a book for children and the rest of the world about love. A powerful word that really can change and transform our world. Now, this girl here is Amora. So Amora is going to take us on a journey around the world with her friends talking about how we can be loved. Thank you so much for reading this book. It starts with me. Dr. King's vision is coming to life, and you guys are going to carry that vision into the world. Have fun reading. We want our children and you parents to be loved in the way you speak, in the way you act, and in the way you think. That's what it starts with me about. It starts with me. I am the one who fix the world with love. It starts with me! As we embrace this urgency of creating the beloved community, now is the time to be loved. Love means understanding, redemptive goodwill toward all which seeks nothing in return. So be loved by implementing the demands of justice to eliminate the school to prison pipeline that has so many black children entrapped. Be loved by correcting voting policies that seek to suppress the votes of millions of black and brown people. Be loved and implement the demands of justice by transforming a society that is disproportionately violent toward black lives, including black transgendered lives and indigenous lives. Be loved and correct false narratives and economic policies that continue to divide and pit poor and working class black and white people against each other. Be loved and implement demands of justice where systems and structures are deconstructed and lead the way of living in community that reimagines just humane, equitable, and sustainable policies, practices, and behaviors. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them who hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. Be loved and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. militarism, racism, and poverty. This beloved community talk is taking place on the 55th anniversary of Dr. King's prolific Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence speech at Riverside Church in New York City, and on the 54th anniversary of the day he was assassinated. So as we gather together in this virtual space, we gather in honor, and we gather to bear witness that the time is still now to eradicate these triple evils. This is part one, militarism. And we are um, coming to this place, to this space, to bring attention to issues, but also uh, to think about how we can apply still the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on behalf of King Center CEO, Dr. Bernice A. King. I welcome you from Wales. I welcome you from all over the world. Listen, if you're watching this right now, we want you to go to Twitter, go to Instagram, go to Facebook, share this broadcast, share the YouTube link, um, host a watch party on Facebook, use the hashtag Beloved Community Talks with an S, hashtag militarism, and then hashtag MLK. That's three hashtags. I want you to get these three hashtags, tweet right now, 
There, there are topics that trend all over the world. Why not this? Why not now? Why not today? Hashtag beloved community talks. Hashtag militarism. Hashtag MLK. As we remember, and then also as we apply. I want to bring on now as we get started with this beloved community talks experience. As you're tweeting, using those hashtags, beloved community talks. Hashtag militarism. Hashtag MLK, welcoming you from Rochester, New York. Thank you for being with us, welcoming you from all over the world. Please continue to share where you're from in the chat spaces on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, wherever you're tuning in. You can also share the YouTube link. Uh, if you're tweeting, if you're tweeting about it, use those hashtags. If you're on Instagram, do a screenshot of the broadcast and share. I'm watching right now on YouTube. This beloved community talks with the King Center and then put in your comments, put in your post on Instagram, catch it right now on the King Center's YouTube page. Just search YouTube, search on YouTube, the King Center, and you'll be there. But joining us first is the CEO of the King Center, Dr. Bernie Say King, uh, who, as I've been thinking about over the last few days, uh, she calls her mother the architect of the King legacy. Of course, the King Center is named after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I believe Dr. Bernie Say King has a specific charge to get nonviolence across the globe. And we have these virtual spaces. So I was thinking today, I'm gonna to start calling her like the, uh, the architect of, of global teaching on nonviolence because that's what she's doing. Uh, that's how she's uh, showing up in the world to get nonviolence everywhere for everyone. And so as we get started, with this beloved community talks, we're gonna have Dr. Bernie Say King come on and join us. Good evening. Good evening, how are you, my friend? I'm good, how are you? I'm wonderful. I've I'm seen wonderful. you everywhere this weekend. <laughs> You've been traveling. Uh, yeah, I've been to New York and back. Yeah. And today at the King Center to Lay a wreath at my uh, mm -hmm. father and my father's um, crypt, but my father and mother side by side, of course. Um, so, and I said a few words there. So that's I've been all over the place. Yeah, and but you've been I'm showing seated. up powerfully. I, I've been sharing with people, as this is also the anniversary of Beyond Vietnam, uh, how that space in New York City at Riverside Church shifted Saturday as you started to read the end of that speech. Um, and I, I know we wanna to talk about a number of things tonight, but I know we need to mention too, um, the agony of choosing a call to conscience. I know that's something you wanted to highlight. So as you uh, begin this beloved community talk and share any comments, uh, when we're, we're done with that piece, could, you, could we talk about that for a moment? The agony. Yeah, the yeah. Power. I mean, you know, in, in that speech, my father said that um, the calling to speak is often a vocation of ag agony, mm. uh, but one must speak. And that's where he found himself on April 4th, 1967, when he uh, publicly, officially uh, came out against the war in Vietnam. I want people to understand that my father was a leader of conscience. I mean, he he always wanted to stay aligned with his conscience. conscience. And because he uh, believed in the eradication of what he called the triple evils of poverty, racism, and militarism, he knew that he could no longer segregate his own conscience as he fought against you know segregation in the South. He could not segregate all of these interests because he saw them as intersectional, intersectional. Um, but it wasn't easy. I want people to understand that although he was a leader of conscience, um, he agonized uh, because he had to take a very strong step in courage and faith, um, knowing that in the end, there were those who would misunderstand um, his position. Um, and so he had to decide, am I gonna stand in this space um, where my colleagues in civil rights who stood right by my side as, as we fought for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act are now saying, Dr. King, don't mix the two, don't blend them, don't create an enemy of President Johnson, who's been you know, a friend of our work. 
Um, he he had to consider uh, the criticism, harsh criticism that he would get from the media. Um, and then he had to consider the fact that his own board, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, would not stand with him or allow him to take that platform as head of the SCLC. Um, there was one member, Reverend Otis Moss Jr., who's still living to, to, today, who was a member of the board who did personally support him. And so that agony uh, uh, for him um, obviously took a lot of courage, a lot of strength, a lot of faith. Uh, but as he said so eloquently in an interview he did with Mike Douglas, and you remember that interview where they asked him, are you, con <laughs> are you concerned that you may have fallen out of favor? Right. Uh, right. with President Johnson by taking this stance against the Vietnam War. And he said, well, that's not what's most important. He said, what's important to me is that I not fall out of favor uh, with uh, what uh, is, is um, I'm trying to remember the exact word, no, that I not fall out of favor with what is true and what my conscience tells me is just and right. Mm -hmm. And then this is the striking thing he went on to say, uh, is that I much rather stay in favor with my conscience than to be, to be concerned about people who may not understand the position that I take. Now that to me wow. is ultimate leadership. When, when you are willing to stand for what's right, what's just and what's true, no matter what the cost is, because you want to stay aligned with your conscience. You don't want to do what he said is the popular thing. You know, you, you're not concerned about what's what's po what's politic and expedient or safe, but you're concerned about doing what conscience tells you is right. And speaking out against that war was the right thing. And my mother really was the person who continued to encourage him just before that time, Martin. Uh, we need your voice in the peace movement because my mother had been in the peace movement since before she met my dad. Um, and um, she had been participating in a number of peace conferences around the world. And she felt that his moral voice was needed in that movement. And so she was with him, even though everybody else <laughs> turned on him. She was right there with him, um, you know, holding him up, um, encouraging him. And I think that's really what helped him to go ahead and take that public stance. Wow. And there's so much there, uh, Dr. King. I believe as we go through this conversation, these two conversations with Shane Claiborne and Dr. Cornell West in this beloved Community Talks experience, we'll explore what you're talking about, how as uh, we discuss militarism, it's very important that we discuss it from the perspective of a call to conscience. Your dad yes, demonstrated exactly. that in Beyond Vietnam in that speech, uh, but also as he began to talk more and more about the war in Vietnam and about militarism, imperialism, uh, the notion of uh, empire and colonialism, all of these things he talks about extensively, a lot of people don't know because we relegate him to, I have a dream. Uh, but as we segue, what would you consider to be, as people are listening to this beloved community talks, one thing that you think people should remember in terms of, of your father as we move into this talk. You talked about his agonizing over this, but how can people, I'll phrase the question this way. Uh, and I even want, if you're watching this right now, one of the things you can tweet right now is, I want to accept a call to conscious. I want everybody to tweet that. Whether yeah. you believe it right now or not, you may be saying, no sister, I don't really believe I wanna do that. but. <laughs> So I want to accept the call to conscience and use those hashtags. They were hashtag beloved community talks, hashtag militarism, hashtag MLK. And I'll abbreviate that question for you, Dr. King. Um, when people want to consider accepting a call to conscience, why is that particularly critical right now? Why is it important that we answer a call to conscience? Well, our world is in trouble. I mean, it's simply... For me, I mean, we're headed in a, a, a dangerous uh, pathway of destruction as a world. Um, and we need people who are willing uh, 
to step in the middle and be willing to sacrifice to say this this way of handling conflict, you know, this way of, of in conflict, I mean, from personally, interpersonally, conflict in Congress, conflict, you know, in society, conflict between nations, this way of handling things is gonna be, is detrimental to us uh, and it's gonna lead to self-destruction. And so we need people, you know, who are willing in their various spheres of influence to, know, to, to stand up, even if it means standing alone. I mean, when mm -hmm. daddy came, you know, uh, he, he came to the point where he said, if I'm the lone voice standing for nonviolence, even if everybody else want to use violence, I'll stand alone uh, because he earnestly loved humanity. He valued the dignity and worth, and he believed people had the right uh, to survive, to live. Um, and so, you know, he was willing uh, to make that necessary sacrifice in courage and, and in faith and in strength because of his love uh, of humanity. And you, you may call it extremist. He said he was on good company being an extremist for love mm -hmm. uh, because that's who Jesus Christ was. Yeah, and so um, I would say to everybody, it's time to, to be that extremist again. We have to be an extremist uh, for, love, for love, for justice, for humanity, not to the point of becoming obsessed uh, where we become the very thing that we're trying to eradicate. Um, but we do it in a way where the dignity and the value and the worth of people are still um, upheld. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to this discussion tonight um, from my, my two brothers. And uh, thank you uh, for hosting this tonight. Uh, and I'm going to be listening in and taking some good notes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. King. Thank you. Thank you to you, to your family. Uh, we remember you today. We're praying for you. We know all over the world we're commemorating this day, uh, but you're a family. And uh, this is different than how we remember the death of, of loved ones and that you're doing it with the world. And so yes. uh, thank you for taking the time to share with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow. As I tell the students who participate in our uh, beloved Community Leadership Academy at the King Center, it is uh, not to be taken for granted when we have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Bernice A. King. Uh, and certainly tonight, as she shared about uh, today, this morning, wherever you are joining us from, and she shared about agonizing over answering this call to conscience as Brother Shane Claiborne comes on now, a uh, wonderful activist who's doing some things to uh, come against and eradicate militarism in two ways that I think are key. Uh, the eradication of the death penalty, but also by taking weapons, guns, and turning them into tools to, to plant and to grow and to sow, which has a great spiritual significance that he highlights as well. And so we want to welcome our friend a friend of the King Center, Brother Shane Claiborne, as he comes on now to continue this conversation around militarism. And not just talking about it, Brother Shane, but talking about how we can eradicate it. You know, we can have great conversations, but then yes. we have to go put in the work, right? Well, I know that's right. <laughs> I know that's right. Joining us. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm doing so well. Better now. I mean, it's a in, in one way, it's a heavy day, you know, as we remember what mm -hmm. happened to Dr. King, but we also are filled with hope. We know that that love triumphs over hatred and life conquers death. I mean, the whole Christian story has got those that paradox, you know, of, of mm -hmm. life and death kind of at war. And uh, uh, but, you know, you mentioned the uh, the swords to, to plows image of the prophets. And w one of the things I love about that is it, it it's this proclamation that things can be made right. You know, that, yes. that even metal that is crafted to kill can be recrafted to cultivate life and uh, all things can be made new. So when we do that, it's a declaration of that. I got a, a you know, a couple of them I brought with me. This is one of our shovels that's made. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can actually still see the Winchester up there uh, that it, it originally was a gun. Even the Woodstock is made, uh, you know, into the handle of it. So, you know, Walter Brueggemann, he talks about the prophetic imagination and uh, uh, he says sometimes we we misunderstand the prophets and we think that they were fortune tellers. 
uh, but they were actually truth tellers. They weren't just trying to predict the future. They were trying to change the future by waking us up and inviting us to uh, have a different imagination about mm -hmm. where we're headed. So that's what, you know, we're about is that, that kind of prophetic imagination. And Dr. King had that, right? That he did. That, Absolutely. That, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, and the other thing I love about the, the, the image is that it says that, that nation will not rise up against nation. They will study war no more, but the change begins with the people. And as you read that prophecy of Mike and Isaiah, it's this image that that peace doesn't come from the top down. Peace comes from the bottom up. Change comes from the bottom. It's not the kings and the politicians and the presidents that lead us to peace. They keep leading us into the wars. It's the people who are so tired of violence that they begin to take things into their own hands and they begin to transform those tools mm -hmm. and the tools of life. They, so they become, in fact, Brother Shane, Dr. K, Dr. King used this phrase, transformed nonconformists. Mm -hmm. That the, the people who are rising up have, in a sense, said, we're not going to study war anymore. We won't accept militarism. We won't accept poverty. We won't accept racism and all these iterations of bigotry and discrimination. And when the people say we've mm -hmm. had enough, I think that's what Dr. King was calling us up to this, this call uh, to consciousness where he talked about unarmed truth and unconditional love. Then we have phrases like militarism, Brother Shane, that when we, when we use that, um, I become concerned that people might not know just what that is. That is yes. um, the use of force, weapons, uh, government control, government, uh, you know, armies, uh, militaries, to keep people in check. And sometimes when we hear it, uh, people think it's just um, about the Navy or it's just about a, a branch of an actual military. But we've seen, particularly in the United States recently, uh, militarized policing. And then we see the effect of building empire that doesn't care about people and how that causes racism and the death penalty and different issues uh, concerning the death penalty. I wanted to, to talk with you about that for a moment. How do you believe militarism is showing up in death penalty policies in the United States? Just giving people a different understanding of militaristic thinking, the notion that it's okay to bomb people hmm. or to hurt people or to tear gas people to get our way. That's yes. a simplified way of, of thinking about it. Yes, Lord, you're preaching tonight, Dr. Von. Uh, you know, but the, 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 one of the things that King does so well is name all of the different manifestations of violence and say mm -hmm. violence is the problem, not the solution. Violence is the disease, not the cure. We're not going to bomb our way into peace. And he, you know, he names that contradiction that we're telling young people that violence won't solve their problems, but then they, you know, they ask us, why does our government use massive doses of violence to try to mm -hmm. solve its problems? And with the death penalty, we do the same thing, right? We're teaching our young people that two wrongs actually can make a right. Because that's exactly right. what it does, right? Like uh, we're trying to kill to show that killing is wrong. And you can't do that. You know, we don't rape people to show that rape is wrong. And there's something wrong with that logic mm. that we're going to deal with violence on its own terms. And so, uh, you know, there's folks that, that uh, you, you know, kind of push back when Dr. King in the Riverside speech calls America the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. But I want to say we, we should just step back a little bit and think about this, that there's lots of folks that talk about American exceptionalism, right? In terms of, you know, we're this kind of beacon of freedom and light. We're this messianic force, the divine kind of uh, people in the world. And uh, Dr. King kind of push, pushes back on that and says, don't let anybody make you think America is God's messianic force to be reckoned with. But this, we've got this different version of American exceptionalism, which is true. We are obsessed with violence. Uh, we, we're one of the only countries in the world that still executes its own people every year. The United States is in the top five executing countries of the world. Often we're always in the top 10. And, and you know, the, the, that's the wrong side of history when it comes to the death penalty. We can do better than 
uh, trying to kill to show that killing's wrong. And Dr. King named that. He said that the death penalty society's final assertion final that we, assertion. we will not forgive. Yes. But then he calls out the the uh, you know the the culture of violence. And in the United States, I mean, we have more guns than people, Dr. Vanetta. We got we got more, five times more McDonald's restaurants, five times more gun dealers than McDonald's restaurants. Five times more gun dealers. We've got five percent of the the world's population, but almost half of the world's guns. So that's why we're we're inviting people to disarm, you know. But when it comes to militarism, and that's what we're talking about tonight, the the triplets of evil, are, you know, the, the militarism. There's only a handful of countries that have nuclear weapons. Out of 196 countries, only nine countries have uh, nuclear weapons. And 93% of the nuclear weapons are owned by two countries, mm -hmm. the U.S. and Russia. We have the capacity in the U.S. of 100,000 Hiroshima bombs. And you start to just think, sit back and go, wow, that's evil. That's evil, right? And we're the only country that has ever used nuclear weapons. And we did it twice in one week, dropping them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is, uh, th that's the exceptionalism, is, is how we continue to live by the sword and die by the sword. And so Dr. And die by the sword. In, in this speech, I mean, he really yeah. invites us to get the log out of our own country's eye. And we're all upset about Russia right now, as we should be. But, you know, in 2003, we were dropping 900 bombs a day on Iraq. And I was there, Dr. Vanetta, as you might know, with, you know, as a part of the resistance, the peace team. And I picked up a piece of shrapnel. This is in March of 2003. That was this is a bomb that was dropped by the U.S. on a public market where dozens of people lost their lives. And you start to see Dr. King say uh, they must see us as strange liberators because we did all of this in the name of freedom and democracy. Even now, you know, we look back and 15 of the 19 hijackers of 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia. But we declared war on Afghanistan and Iraq and we're still selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, the biggest a buyer of U.S. military weapons. So, I mean, that, that's the contradiction that King saw, right? Is that we're providing arms to the whole world and continuing to prove that Jesus is right when he said, you live by the sword, you're going to die by it. Let me, let me ask you a question, uh, Brother Shane, because as you were talking about uh, something from Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam, where he talked about we need to, uh, first he said, our concerns need to become ecumenical rather than sectional. But he also mentioned that we need to focus on broader allegiances and loyalties than nationalism and our nation's goals. And yeah. I think one of the things you're talking about that, that's causing a law to be in our eye is nationalism. And we think about nationalism and its, its impact on cultivating militarism, this idea that we have to protect our territory and that this nation built empire through slavery and yes. through genocide. And uh, that's what imperialism is. We'll talk about imperialism more with Dr. Cornell West, but can you share for a moment, how do we get to those broader allegiances? I think Dr. King's talking about spiritual allegiances, allegiances to humanity that yes. calls us to say, we won't study war. We're gonna turn guns into to tools of peace. We're going to uh, end the death penalty. How do we get there? Give us some insight. Well, that that uh, that that calling beyond nationalism is a radical call. You know, M Mother Teresa, she as I was listening to Dr. King's, uh, you know, reading the speech again, I, one of the lines that I uh, reminded me uh, of something Mother Teresa said. And she said, sometimes our biggest problem is that the circle we draw around our family is too small. Woo! is too small, right? And that's the problem with nationalism <laughs> is that the circle we put around our family is too small. And Dr. King is inviting us to love bigger, to love better, uh, to say that if someone is suffering on the other side of the wall in the US and Mexico or the wall in Israel and Palestine, it's as troubling 
as if it were mm-hmm. my own mother, father, or sister and brother. And I grew up in the evangelical church and it kind of became, became cliche to, to have the born again experience. And we, we kind of trivialize that. But I, I almost think we got to take it back and say that what Jesus is inviting us into is to have a bigger vision of family. That uh, we are born again, and when, even when his own biological mother and brother come, uh, they say, your mom and brother are here, and Jesus says, who is that? Who, who is my family? My family is bigger than biology. And that is what we are, are, are invited into, is this uh, fellowship, this family, this beloved community that is bigger than biology, bigger than nationality, and saying that every person is made in the image of God, and they're just as precious as my own kin. Yes. Now, now that thinking will help us con- conquer militarism because we'll consider how we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Listen, if you're watching right now, as we conclude our conversation with Brother Shay, and I want you to tweet, post right now this quote from Dr. King. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. If we're going to conquer militarism, racism, poverty, and all the iterations of those three, we are going to have to realize that we are interconnected, interdependent. What Brother Shane is talking about, even if you're not a Christian, if you don't follow Jesus, you need to grab the idea that we are a human family. And what happens to someone in Russia, Tigray, uh, what happens to someone in the Congo, what happens to someone in Australia, what happens in Yemen, what happens in Palestine on the Gaza Strip, it happens to me because we belong to each other. So get that quote. I want you to tweet that with hashtag beloved community talks, hashtag, uh, what are hashtag, Brother Shane? You know, militarism. That's it. Hashtag militarism. Yep. Hashtag MLK. Get it out there. Brother Shane, one last comment for us uh, this evening. One thing you want to share to encourage people to accept the call to conscience to eradicate these triple evils. I, I want to say that, I, you know, as I, as I look at Dr. King constantly, one of the things that strikes me is that he knows that this is a countercultural call. It is a call to mm-hmm. revolution and it's, it's a revolution of love. And it, it's that, you know, when, when someone threw an insult that he was maladjusted, he embraced it. And he said, he said, we've become way too adjusted to, to some injustice things we, we should not be adjusted to, right? We become mm-hmm. way too adjusted to violence and to racism and to inequity between the rich and the poor. So we need some holy maladjusted people and to, to stand against the triplets of evil is is to stand for love and that that can be uh something that might lead us to jail but as john lewis and dr king would say that's why we can smile in our mug shots because we know that we're on the right side of history but right now it is a countercultural call that goes against the the cultural values of, of racism and militarism and materialism thank you so much brother shane you've given us you. our second statement we, our first statement was, I will accept the call to conscience. This is your, the first statement, rather, was I will accept the call to conscience. The second statement is this, I will be maladjusted to injustice. I want you to tweet that, write that down. We, we're talking about how to do the work after this, and there's some inside work we need to do. I will accept the call to conscience. I will be maladjusted to injustice. Thank you so much for that, Brother Shane. You're, you provided some great insight. This always, evening. always Thank good to be together. Us. We'll do it again soon. And I'm, yes, I'm honored sir, to be with us, Dr. Family. Bernice. And- Grateful uh, to be a part of your community and to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Love y'all. Yeah, I'll be listening love in on Dr. Dr. West. I, I, I love Dr. Cornell. So we'll see you soon. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you, sir. I will be maladjusted to injustice. I will be maladjusted to injustice. Listen. We have a a video coming up, and when we come back, we'll continue our next conversation. The King Center's beloved Community Leadership Academy is excited about the opportunity to help students recognize and develop their potential to become nonviolent leaders in industries such as technology, innovation, business, and entrepreneurship. 
Our multi-year program is the first nonviolent youth incubator that enables youth to dream, build, innovate, and commercialize inventions that further Dr. King's living legacy. Applying Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence to the technology and innovation sphere, youth will design nonviolent mobile apps, vlogs, 3D CADs, digital games, and all other career design opportunities that creatively solve global issues. Students will challenge themselves to grow professionally and academically through our project-based learning model. Our academy utilizes a four-pronged model. One, learn. Students will be educated in the philosophy and methodology of Kingian nonviolence, what we call Nonviolence 365. Two, ideate. Students will participate in an ideation lab where they apply their nonviolence knowledge to design innovations aimed at social change. Three, build. Students will build their own nonviolent inventions, such as mobile apps, vlogs, 3D CADs, and digital games. Four, pitch. Students will pitch their own business plan, company structure, patents, funding models, and work with business mentors to commercialize their nonviolence inventions. Students will have the opportunity to engage in networking opportunities with business professionals and representatives from the King Center, universities, Fortune 500 companies, and civic leaders who will empower today's youth with the skills to effectively implement Dr. King's philosophy and methodology of nonviolence, while also empowering them to define pathways to success in life. The beloved Community Leadership Academy is the premier youth program of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. The beloved Community Leadership Academy is committed to developing the next generation of compassionate, courageous, and conscientious nonviolent leaders to solve pressing world issues. For more information and to apply, please visit www.thekingcenter.org forward slash leadership academy love now i know many of you saying what do you mean by love because people have so many different understandings of love what i am talking about is not the powerless the weak and the anemic love no 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 i'm talking about be love and implement the demands of justice be love and use your power to correct everything that stands against love. The urgency of now is to dig in and create the beloved community by rising up to be loved. Let's go forward in this moment and bridge the divide. Let's go forward to create the beloved community. Let's go forward and rise up to be loved. Welcome back. Listen, those just weren't any videos. I know I said we were going to uh, watch some videos, but that first video was about the Beloved Community Leadership Academy. I want to encourage you to go to the kingcenter.org uh, and go to the Beloved Community Leadership Academy and share that academy information with family and friends. Educators can nominate students. Uh, we want to fill that academy up this summer. It's not just a, a summer academy it continues for two years and we want to be sure uh, that students uh, from all over the world it's a global virtual academy so no matter where you're watching from we want your application we want you to get it in become a dream builder not just a dreamer because dr king was more than a dreamer sometimes people say he was a dreamer and i think dr king was a doer as well so we want you to be a dream builder youth age ages 13 through 18 with our beloved community leadership academy and we invite you to take the be love pledge join us for a movement to implement the demands of justice across the globe and justice is not revenge it's not retaliation dr king said justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love we invite you to join us in being love everywhere we go every day Go to, to thekingcenter.org backslash be love 
and take the Be Love Pledge and join us in that movement. Having these first two segments been amazing. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm, I'm genuinely, genuinely excited uh, about the prospect of us getting rid of these triple evils. And I believe that we can do it. And one of the writers who convinced me that we could eradicate these evils, uh, beginning with his, his book, Race Matters, uh, one of my mentors gave me that book in 2000, 2000, I was about to add a number, but it was just 2000. As an AmeriCorps member in Metro Atlanta, uh, Mr. Gary Turner used to say to me all the time, Vanetta West, and that was how he said my name, you need to think globally and comprehensively. And one of the books he recommended to me was Race Matters by Dr. Cornell West. So I come to this conversation having read that book and um, number of other, a number of other books by Dr. Cornell West and believing that we need critical thinkers and strategic doers. And he happens to be both critical thinkers, love-centered critical thinkers, I would add, and strategic doers. And so we want to welcome now uh, Dr. Cornell West as we continue our conversation about militarism part one of our beloved community talk series on the triple evils. Welcome, Dr. West. Well, you know, it's a blessing to be here, my dear sister, Dr. Vanetta West. I'm sure you're my cousin. We look for I'm sure too. I'm sure too. Louisiana we'll find out. But you have been masterful in terms of how you orchestrate. I'm more like Mary Lou Williams on the piano, the orchestrated this conversation. You know, we started <laughs> you, on a, a high note with our dear sister, Dr. Bernice A. King. Yes. Nobody like her. She, she exemplifies a spiritual nobility that's rooted in her family. And I always talk about Brother Martin and Sister Coretta together because in so many ways, they are dual forces mm -hmm. for good when it comes to truth and beauty and goodness and justice and conscience and so forth. And Brother Shane, whew, what a truth teller he is. We've marched in the streets of Philadelphia and Standing Rock for indigenous peoples as well. And he's rooted in the gospel and got his love focused on the least of these echoes of the chapter. He does. Of chapter of Matthew. Indeed. He does. He's, he's genuine too. Absolutely. Uh, Cousin Cornell. That's what I'm going to call you now. Cousin Cornell, he's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's he's right. genuine, genuine heart uh, for people. You, you do, you, you have have that as well. I've seen where you're protesting with younger people and uh, standing with them to um, non-violently protest injustice. And your words, I believe, uh, in the introduction to Radical King, it's a compilation of Dr. King's, of Dr. King's speeches that you uh, pulled mm -hmm. together. But there's something that resonates with me there. Um, when you talk about these catastrophes, I think it's important. Uh, that we get the language that you use there because you you talk about these things that Dr. King stood for eradicating and you break apart poverty and materialism separately. But what's key for this conversation is that you said that m militarism is an imperial catastrophe. Now, I, I want to start there with you because I when I hear that and I think about empire and how the quest for empire has laid waste to human beings across the globe. I just want to talk for a moment about the part that, that a desire to build and have conquest plays into militarism. Can you share more about mm. that with us? Well, I mean, you, you raise a deep question here because see, I understand uh, yourself, myself, others who choose no matter what color to be part of a blues tradition. And the blues is catastrophe lyrically expressed. So mm. to be a blues person is to be on intimate terms of catastrophe. It could be empirical catastrophe. It could be economic catastrophe. It could be spiritual catastrophe. It could be political catastrophe. Mm. It's the shattering of persons and trying to reduce them to callous entities rather than what they really ought to be, which is creative human beings made in the image of God who bounce back individually and collectively in order to change the world for the benefit of the least of these. And so we have to first be truth tellers and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. So you have to be very honest and candid and unflinching in lifting your voice. That's the anthem of a blues people. 
not to echo. No, we don't need no extension of echo chambers. That's too conformist. We want courage. Mm. And that's mm. what Coretta Martin King stood for. Courage to hope, courage to love, courage to think critically, courage to call out forms of catastrophe. And the response, what has been the response of black people at our best? You know, of all of the thousands of spirituals that they discovered, there's not one that talks about hating other people. <laughs> you know, of all the lynchings that our black folk have had to come to terms with, black people have never opted for a black version of the Ku Klux Klan because we opted for higher moral and spiritual grounds rather than get in the gutter with the gangster because we know we got some gangster in us. <laughs> and we need to push it out. We got some hatred and greed in us, what the great Howard Thurman called the hounds of hell. We got that greed. We got that hatred in us. That's what we had to tell the folk in Charlottesville when they came up to us, spitting at us and so forth. And so how come you call us brother? Because Jesus loves you the way he loves you. You choose to be a gangster. I was a gangster before I met Jesus. And now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. So mm -hmm. it's a human continuum that we have, but we're on terms with catastrophe. What does that mean? Militarism. All 800 military units around the world, military budget bigger than the next 11 countries put together. Let us be honest. Let us try to tell the truth. We were just, I just seen the other day that uh, Brother Biden called Brother Putin a war criminal. I said, well, we got to tell the truth anytime you kill innocent folks, especially in any kind of massive way. Doors are war crimes, but you got to watch yourself. Why? Because a splinter in the eye can be the largest magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you got some war crimes on your side and you keeping track of war crimes on Russia's side, then you need some moral consistency. You need some spiritual constancy. Anytime you kill an innocent person is a crime against humanity. It could be African, it could be Latin American, it could be Asian, it could be Middle Eastern, mm -hmm. it could be white, black, red, Jewish, Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, agnostic, secular, all made in the image of God, equally precious, equally priceless. And once you follow then, that project, ooh, then you're getting ready for the cross. Must Jesus better cross alone and all the world go free now? There's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. You got to be willing to pay a cost. What we love about Coretta, what we love about Martin was that deep radical love. Radical love. Was willing that to pay a cost. Pay a cost, uh, Cousin Cornell, but also to extend ourselves beyond our nations. And I mentioned that with Brother Shane, but what you just brought up is a kind of pledge of allegiance to empire and to a nation that has to be in order for us to eradicate race, uh, racism, militarism, and poverty. I think that has to be uh, below an allegiance to uh, broader concepts, to spiritual concepts, to That's humanity. Right. How do we get there when you think about what's happening where people have such an allegiance to nation uh, and to race that we, we forget each other, that we forget that we're connected? What is the, what we talk about a call to conscience, uh, how do we get beyond this nationalism and imperialism? What are your thoughts on that? Mm, always a wonderful question. Again, I think we have to always look for examples. We don't need abstract formulations. We need concrete exemplars. Mm -hmm. What did Harriet Tubman sojourn the truth do? What did Frederick Douglass do? What did, I, what did Ida B. Wells do? What did W.B. Du Bois do? They attempted to, always look at the world through the lens of the least of these christians like myself is the lens of the cross that means following jesus into the temple running out money changes not because you hate the rich but because you hate greed and you love poor people who are being exploited and that means willingness to go against the grain be in the world but not of the world to be transformed in such a way that you're willing to empty yourself and give yourself to serve others and take the, the, the hit, as it were, the great Bonhoeffer called it the cost of discipleship. But we know that we don't have to uh, confine it to our own Christian context. You can be a uh, uh, Hindu like Gandhi. You can be a Buddhist mm -hmm. like Ambedkar or Bell Hooks. You can be agnostic like James Baldwin. We don't know what W.B. Du Bois was. He was one of those spiritual <laughs> but not 
religious kind of brothers, but he had the love flowing at him and flowing from him. And that is the key. Because if you're going to be a truth teller, you're telling the truth not just to the powerful, you're telling the truth to everybody. Relatively powerless too. You got to critique mm -hmm. of empire, absolutely. But you also got to critique of patriarchy. You also got to critique of white supremacy. You also got to critique of male supremacy. You got to critique of transphobia. You're keeping in contact with the humanity of everybody. Non-binary is made in the image of God. The Imago Dei. Oh, what mm. a powerful formulation our Jewish brothers and sisters gave the world in terms of Hebrew scripture. What it really means to be made in the image of God and spread that essence, that steadfast love to the orphan and widow and fatherless and motherless and persecuted and subjugated. And then here comes a Palestinian Jew named Jesus that said, we're going to love our enemies. Mm. Yes, because we're going to have so <laughs> many of them because we loving poor people. We loving those who have been pushed to the margin. So we're not obsessed with our enemies. We don't want revenge toward our enemies. We don't right. hate our enemies. We hate what our enemies do. We hate oppression. We hate injustice. I learned that in Vacation Bible School in Shiloh Baptist Church. You hate the sin and love the sinner. That's not just some simplistic formulation. That's a way of life. And that's it, what Brother also, Martin and Sister Coretta and Sister Bernice and others understand so well. Cousin Cornell, I want to point out because when you raise the, the driving out money changers because uh, you hate greed, not because you hate rich people. I started to think about uh, the third principle of nonviolence. Nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice and not people who are perpetuating injustice. That's very key. When you talk about eradicating these triple evils, that is not about hating the people who cultivate these evils. It's about getting rid of these injustices. If we focus that way, what can we do? Because a lot of people, people's time today is spent on hating people and, and saying this person is horrible versus saying this injustice is horrible. And I think that a part of this call to conscience and a part of eradicating militarism is to look at war and say, we have to get rid of this. How do we do this? Uh, That's exactly what, are, what are your thoughts on, um, <laughs> thank you, sir. What are, you, what are your, your thoughts on what we're, we're seeing today, um, not just with, with Russia because, and, and Ukraine, because there's a lot of attention on that, but we know militarism is a global pandemic. It's happening all over the world. In Tigray, there's a humanitarian crisis. Our, our neighbors in Yemen, are still suffering and there's not a lot of attention being paid to that and, and always you know in other African nations because of the the uh, devastation of colonialism and slavery and uh, empire imperialism when we look at what's happening in the world um, how do we get can you share your thoughts on how we get media to focus on militarism as not something that the United States is separate from? but something that we need to correct within our nation and within our government. Dr. King, I believe he was, he was correct when he said that the greatest purveyor of, of violence at that time and probably now was our own nation. But it's hard to get people to see that when they live somewhere. But we're not mm. saying it to hate America. We're saying it to call America into accountability. How do we get people to see the, the need for accountability concerning militarism? I think, one, we have to acknowledge that the most powerful ideology of the modern world is nationalism and the mm. allegiance to the nation state that convinces people to live and die for it. If you ask somebody to live and die for blackness, to live and die for womanness, to live and die for the trade union movement, or to live and die for gayness or less, you're going to get more folk dying for the flag than you're going to get folk for dying for all of those things. That's what I mean mm. by nationalism and powerful ideology. Now, here we come and say, every flag is under the cross. And Brother Martin says that cross stands for unarmed truth and unconditional love, love and the condition of truth to allow suffering to speak. And love means you have a steadfast commitment to all of our fellow human beings, beginning with the least of these, the poor, working people, the prisoners, the marginalized, disinherited, the, the children, disinherited, the, disinherited, the yeah. dis disabled, and so forth, you see. Now, when you look at it in that way, then you say, well, America, your dominant myth is the frontier. What is the frontier? Moral regeneration through violence. Ask our indigenous brothers and sisters. 
Brother Shane and I saw that in Standing Rock, right? 1492. That's the World War been going on ever since. Then you got black folk bring over African folk, slavery, the most barbaric of modern forms of domination. That's violence. Then you got violence against the working class. They didn't have a chance to engage in collective bargaining until 1936. Argentina had it in 1836. And if they, tried, if they attempted to organize, they were crushed. That's violence. Then you got domestic violence against precious sisters of all colors. Violence against gays and lesbians. We're a deeply violent society because we think we get more regeneration through it. That's what January 6th was mm -hmm. about. They got more regeneration. See how they feeling so good? It's like watching a John Wayne movie. You see it in the films. It's in our novels and so forth. So what do we do? Here come Martin Coretta, countervailing <laughs> forces. Examples. It wasn't just talking about it. They were being a hope. Be love, as Sister Bernice said, Dr. King said. Be love. Mm -hmm. Start with yourself. Connect it to others. And don't do it in the spirit of self-righteousness because we got some violent proclivities inside of us. We know that. All of us mm -hmm. have that. The question is whether we have the moral and spiritual wherewithal to direct it in the right way. And that's always a challenge. That's why we need each other. Uh, and we're living in such grim times, you know, organized hatred and institutionalized greed. I mean, you think of a, a militarism on a national level, you think of uh, an international level, you think of the, uh, the arm manufacturers and the war profiteers. One of the reasons why Je Jesus went in the temple and his mm. <laughs> disciples got, mm. got scared is because there were 400 troops protecting that temple. And you had bankers on one side and the intellectuals rationalized the bankers on the other side. And here comes Jesus, the country boy from Nazareth. And he's going to run them out and end up on a cross, <laughs> put to death by the most powerful empire of the day out of what? Love. Out of deep, deep love. And Stevie Wonder says love in me to love. John Coltrane says love supreme. Mm -hmm. How much love do we really have? Because we're in a moment in which love itself is in need of love. We look like we're running out. Brother Martin said, is it too late? Is it too late? That's the question no. that we have to continually push. Let us make sure it is not too late. Not too we late. will be love warriors right. until we die. Uh, cousin Cornell, now I know you're really my cousin now because you're using music. That's something <laughs> I do in training and in conversation. You got to bring up the song. So when you start yeah. talking about love's in need of love, it made me think we need to add just a third statement based off of what Brother Cornell uh, cousin Cornell, rather for me, just just shared. Uh, we have two statements already. The first statement was, "I will accept the call to conscience." Second statement was, "I will be maladjusted to injustice." And I want you to add this third one to eradicate militarism. We need to start in us because there's some some stuff in us that thinks we need to conquer people and conquer situations. So this is it. We want to add this third statement. I will embrace humanity as my family. I will embrace all of humanity as my family. I want to add that as a third mm -hmm. statement as we conclude our conversation today, Cousin Cornell. The time went by fast. We could probably mm -hmm. talk for another two or three hours, but I think oh, they shut true, the BCT down. It's a lesson to be in conversation uh, with you, my dear cousin. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for all that you do, uh, you and Brother Shane. We appreciate you joining us for this conversation. I just want to encourage everyone to read The Radical King, to read The Radical King. It is a stunning compilation of, uh, of, of thoughts and writings and teachings from Dr. King, where one of the things uh, Cousin Cornell says, he says, the Radical King was a warrior for peace on the domestic and global battlefields. When you remember Dr. King today, remember he was a warrior for peace on the domestic and global battlefields. He was a staunch anti-colonial and anti-imperial thinker and fighter. Yes, he was. His revolutionary commitment to nonviolent resistance in America and abroad tried to put a break on the escalating militarism running amok across the globe. That's part of the introduction from Radical King. So if the introduction's like that, then you, you know 
that the compilations of writings from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. are astounding. Thank you so much for being with us, Cousin Cornell. It's been great talking to you. Salute you, my dear sister. Love you, love you. Thank you, sir. And sister love Bernice you too. and brother Shane, all of them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that hour just went, didn't it? Uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, I want to be sure you get these three statements as we go through this three-part series on the triple evils we will continue to add statements action steps things we can do as we talk about these triple evils to eradicate them this talk we focused on what starts with us what's in us i will accept the call to conscience i will be maladjusted to injustice i will embrace all of humanity as my family. I will accept the call to conscience. I have to say that myself. I will be maladjusted to injustice. I will embrace all of humanity as my family. When we do that, then we can bring some attention to why is militarism something we need to eradicate immediately? And why do we need to do that using nonviolence because it is a pathway to eradicating those evils without being evil and without being unjust. And so as we conclude, we encourage you to study nonviolence with the King Center. We have virtual series coming up. We have a series on the making of a leader that's coming up that you'll start to see advertisements about and tweets and posts about in the coming days. And we have an online institute at the King Center Institute.org. You can also find it at the King Center.org, a self-paced nonviolence course that you can take. Listen, we need to learn this. We need to know it starts with us. We need to get these principles and steps of nonviolence. I do. I'm a practitioner, I'm a trainer, but every day I find in exploring myself another way that I can get closer to for me, uh, what is a, a faith move of being more like who I say I follow. And for you, it may be, I wanna be more in my family, I wanna show it more in my community. Whatever it may be, we want you to study with us and let's apply nonviolence. Let's apply nonviolence to transform our culture, ourselves and our society. Thank you so much for joining us for this beloved Community Talks virtual experience. We will see you for part two.